Shalom and greetings from Jerusalem. My name is Joan Lippis, or hashtag Joni in Jerusalem, of Novea Ministries and Joni's Jewels. And today I want to talk about one of my most favorite subjects, the Passover. Why? Because it points to the most important topic in my life, the Passover lamb, Yeshua, the Passover lamb. Now, one of the things that we have to remember always is what is God's perspective? Always, what is God's perspective? Now, the movie, the great movie, The, the uh, Ten Commandments, talk about Passover being the night of deliverance. It's all about freedom. Well, certainly there was deliverance, and certainly God was bringing Israel out, the children of Israel out of bondage and into freedom. But God's perspective is something completely different. It wasn't the effect, but the cause. Listen. And it shall be when your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? That you shall say, it is the Passover sacrifice of the Lord. It is the Passover sacrifice of the Lord. In other words, the Passover lamb who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians and delivered our households. So Passover is extremely important. My Hebrew teacher, Rabbi, uh, Rabbi, well, he, he could have been Dr. Ron Allen, used to say that the Passover is the fulcrum of the Old Testament as the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ is the apex of the new. Because the Passover, when we understand the totality of it, from God's first meeting with Moses in front of the burning bush, all the way until Israel walked into the promised land and ate their first harvest, reaped their first harvest. All of that actually is part of that whole deliverance, if you will, that was won by the sacrifice of the Passover lamb. Now, another very important highlight, if you will, that we're going to be discussing is the tables, the tables involved. I have written a Passover book called The Three Tables Passover Service, the Passover Haggadah, starting with the table of Moses in Egypt, moving into the table of Yeshua in the upper room, not too far from where I'm sitting, and finally the ultimate table, the ultimate banquet, the marriage supper of the Lamb. And we're going to see how one, how the Passover in Egypt began to morph into the Passover in the upper room, which was the new covenant, and pointed to the betrothal of the people of God to their Messiah. All of that combined in the Passover lamb. And that's what we're gonna be walking through tonight, the three tables. So if you will, the Passover commemorates the past while celebrating the present and anticipating the future. Or we can look at the four R's, not the three R's of education, but the four R's of the feasts. We remember who God is and what he's done in the past. So we can recognize Yeshua, we can recognize Jesus, and then we can rest in our present no matter what is going on in our lives or in the world, and we can rejoice in the future. Because if you've come under the blood of the Passover lamb, you know you're gonna be sitting at that marriage supper, that marriage supper, that wonderful marriage supper. supper. We also see through the Passover event, a prophetic significance. Certainly we see deliverance from bondage. Israel was freed from the bondage of Egypt as the believer is freed from the bondage of sin. We see God's plan of redemption through the blood of the Passover lamb in Egypt, through the blood of the Passover lamb, Yeshua, a price always has to be paid, and we were purchased at a very high price. Then we see both 
the process of salvation and then the process of sanctification leading up to glorification. Salvation, sanctification, glorification, all wrapped up in this feast of Passover. Now, remember what Moses said when, when Israel found themselves between a rock and a hard place or between Pharaoh and the Red Sea? Don't be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation that the Lord will accomplish for you today. It's all about what God accomplishes for us. Another very important thing that we will understand as we look at the three tables is the issue of the communal meal. God said, we see it in Deuteronomy when he was talking about bringing our sacrifices to the place where he puts his name, namely Jerusalem, where I am sitting. But he says then, and bring your sacrifices and share a meal before the Lord. Community, communal meal. And it's not just your family. In Egypt, it wasn't just the family, the household family. It was if your lamb is too small, bring in your neighbor. And what does God say to us today? Bring in the disenfranchised, bring in the single, bring in the widow, bring in the orphan. And yes, invite those people who don't know me yet. Go into the highways and the byways and bring them on in. Hallelujah. So the communal meal is actually a part of worship. It is a part of worship. So with that overview, let's go to the first major, major, major highlight. And that is where God gives each, uh, Moses his memorial name. And we start in Exodus 2, verse 23. Now it happened in the process of time that the king of Egypt died. Then the children of Israel groaned because of their bondage and their cry came out and their cry came up to God because of their bondage. Now listen to these verbs. So God heard their groaning. They weren't reading from a prayer book. They weren't, even, they weren't in a prayer meeting. They couldn't even enunciate their prayers. All they could do was groan. And God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And beloved friend, God has made promises to you. Many of them are in this book. You notice it's read because the Bible should always be read. But he made promises to you as you pray. Very specific promises to you. And he has never forgotten. He always remembers them. And God looked upon the children of Israel. Now that word in Hebrew, yireh, also means to provide. God sees what we need and provides. It has been changed because they, they put a J in front of it. I guess it was a German who wrote the song, Jehovah Jireh, there ain't no such animal. <laughs> yireh, not, anyway. And God acknowledged them. And that word acknowledge is to know with understanding. God knew by personal experience what they were going through. How can God, who is a spirit, understand what we're going through? God became a man, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And in all of our trials, in all of our temptations, in all of our sufferings, Yeshua had the same, because he humbled himself to become a man, laying aside his glory. So let's go on. God heard, God remembered, God looked, and God understood, acknowledged. Now we're in chapter 3, verse 4. So when, um, no, let me go down. And the Lord said, verse 7, And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt, and I've heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. There it is again. God understands. Listen. Two-letter word, so. So. So what? 
So I will, I have come down to deliver them. I have come down to deliver them. Friends, there it is right there. That's the gospel. God, the son laid aside his glory and humbled himself to come down. And when Moses said, well, what's your name? Who should, who should I tell people? You know, who should I tell them? And that's when God gave his memorial name. In the English translations, we say, I am, I am sent me. I am that I am because th there is no, there re really isn't a way of explaining it. I am past, present and future. Or again, quoting my, my dear teacher, Ron Allen, it is the God who is actively and intimately involved in your life. Friends, he is actively and intimately involved in your life. That is the memorial name of God that is used every time in your English translations, every single time you see capitals, capital L-O-R-D, it's Yahweh is the way I pronounce it. We don't know how to pronounce it. And anybody who says that they know how to pronounce it is looking at the wrong resource books. We don't know. We don't know. The name of God, this memorial name, why is it so important? Why am I making such a big deal out of it? Because it gives you God's identity. It's his identity. It tells us he is, he has authority. He has authority over the creation, over us, over everything. He is the ultimate and supreme sovereign God. And he is beyond time and space. As I said yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Foreshadows Yeshua. What else? What is another highlight that we see in, in, in this Passover? Well, let's go to Exodus 4 and verse 22. What we see here is God's unique relationship with Israel. Moses has gone to Pharaoh and he is pleading for his people. And God says, then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord. Ooh, you can almost hear the, the, the drums going. Thus says the Lord. Israel is my son, my firstborn, my firstborn. So I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. But if you refuse to let him go, indeed, I will kill your son, your firstborn. So what does it mean to be the firstborn son of God? The firstborn... In the ancient times, and still in many cultures today, the firstborn has very specific and unique privileges and responsibilities. I want to repeat that. In the one new man, Jew and Gentile in Christ stand equal before God, but there are distinctions, and the distinctions of Israel we have very unique privileges, but oh boy, do we have responsibilities to go with that. And now let's look at chapter 8. We're still in Exodus and verses 20 to 23, showing God's unique relationship with Israel, making a distinction. <clears throat> this is now the fourth plague. And the Lord said to Moses, Rise early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh as he comes out to the water. Then say to him, Thus says the Lord, Let my people go that they might serve me. Or else, if you will not let my people go, I will send swarms of flies on you and your servants, on your people, and into your houses. The houses of the Egyptians shall be full of swarms of flies and also the ground on which they stand. Yuck. And in that day, I will set apart the land of Goshen in which my people dwell, that no swarms of flies shall be there. Why? In order that you may know that I am the Lord in the midst of the land. 
I will make a difference between my people and your people. Tomorrow this sign shall be. So another very important highlight, especially for those who believe in replacement theology that the church has replaced Israel, not true. God makes a distinction. He makes a separation of Israel. Even today, even today with the church, the blessed, wonderful church of Jew and Gentile, there still is a distinction of Israel against the nations. Not Jews, that's a whole other story and I have to be very, very careful. And if you're unsure of, of this teaching, I have a book that's out. It's just really a little booklet called The One New Man with Distinctions Without Division. Okay, now another highlight, we wanna to go to Exodus 6.6. 6. And we see this in the table, not only the table in Egypt, but ultimately the table in the upper room. God is making some promises, Exodus 6.6. 6. Therefore say to the children of Israel, I am the Lord. I will bring you out from under the burdens of, of the Egyptians. I will rescue you from their bondage. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. I will take you as my people and I will be your God. Those four promises are remembered in the Passover service with four cups or four sips of wine. And each of those have a very huge, unique significance. And I'll give you a hint. They foreshadow the Galilean process of the betrothal. Remember, we're going to wind up in the marriage supper of the Lamb. So we're going to remember those four promises. <sighs> so now let's go into Egypt. We're going to the table of Moses in Egypt. God was building his kingdom. He was taking a family and he was going to make out of that family after 430 years of, of slavery, a nation. Remember from the beginning, from the garden, God's plan was always to make a kingdom, a kingdom of Jew and Gentile. But he started with a man, Abraham and Abraham's family, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Jacob's family. And now this family of Jacob we find in Egypt, in bondage, and now they're going to come out through the Passover event and become a nation. And it was a nation with a purpose. God chose Israel to be his witness so that you, beloved, if you're a Gentile, you would know him. And it wasn't just then, it's today. People who say, well, God has put Israel on the side as he's working through the church. Nonsense, absolutely nonsense. Yes, he's doing wonderful things through the church, but what you think, he's just turned his back on Israel? No way. Because Israel is still God's witness. It's just you know, God is saying, will you please watch Israel? Look at their good, look at their bad, and look at their ugly. But I'm faithful to Israel. If we don't see what God is doing in, through, for, and by Israel today, you're just blind. Okay? So, we're talking about the, the Passover in Egypt. And it was very, very specific, wasn't it? Very specific. They had, there were details about the lamb. You take the lamb on the 10th day, you check it, da, 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 then you sacrifice it on the 14th, etc. It's very detailed. Then, what were they going to eat? Well, they were going to eat lamb, bitter herbs, and unleavened bread. That's all. That's all. So, all of this required time, energy, and determination. They extended the invitation to their neighbors, which I said. Those neighbors 
created a mixed multitude. We see this later on as they were leaving. So there were right there Jew and Gentile. But in those days, they had to agree to join themselves to Israel by worshiping the God of Israel. That mixed multitude got Israel into a whole lot of trouble. Okay? And then the final detail, sacrifice the blood, sacrifice the lamb, and where to put the blood. They probably sacrificed it right on the threshold of the, their door. You know, where else? They didn't have a temple. They had no other place. So the blood was down at the bottom of the door, on the top, and the two sides. Connect the dots. Sign of the cross, right there. And they needed to be ready because at a moment's notice, they were out of there, absolutely out of there. So all of this, my friends, required obedience, faith, action, and submission. If we are going to be a follower and a disciple of the Passover lamb, it means total and immediate obedience, faith, requires some kind of action and submission. Note that I didn't say surrender. It was a choice to submit. So what do we see as an application from this? Well, all are welcome, but they had to be circumcised. They had to be circumcised. But later on, we see that the circumcision of the flesh wasn't enough. They were still not fully obedient, faithful, and submissive. And they did not do what they were told to do. And that's why God said, get a new heart, a heart that's circumcised. How in the world do you circumcise your heart? The Lord does that for you. When we come in total submission. He puts this Holy Spirit inside of us, gives us a new heart, a circumcised heart. So with that, I'm going to end part one and say, and say stay tuned for part two, the upper room. Shalom. Shalom.